Good morning. Uh, this hearing is called to order. The emission of heat trapping gases from electric power plants is a huge source of global warming pollution in our country and around the world. If we are to solve this problem, we need to transform this process into one that provides us the power we need from safe, clean, affordable sources of electricity, starting immediately. Right now, the combustion of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas produce the majority of U.S. electricity, over 70 percent, and is responsible for about 40 percent of carbon dioxide emissions. Excluding hydropower, renewables make up just 2.4 percent of electricity generation in the United States. The good news is that the way we generate electricity is beginning to change. Last year, over 2,400 megawatts of new generating capacity were added across the country from wind, trailing only the new capacity added from natural gas. Meanwhile, last year, we added only 600 megawatts of new capacity from coal and no additional capacity from nuclear. This year, projections indicate that we are going to add uh, between 3,000 and 4,000 new megawatts of wind capacity, uh, and that is big news. This increased use of wind and other renewable technologies, such as solar, biomass, and geothermal, is due in part to the, state, the states that have been taking the lead in requiring the production of renewable electricity. Across the country, there has been a groundswell of public support for changing the way we generate electricity. Currently, 25 states and a district have put in place renewable electricity standards. A state renewable electricity standard may vary in how much renewable ele electricity it requires or its definition of eligible renewable projects, but all share the same goal to move our electricity sector away from fossil fuels and produce global that produce global warming pollution and towards clean, renewable technologies. Uh, that will be the goal of our hearing today. Uh, we uh, thank uh, all who are going to participate. Um, the energy bill, which just passed in August, adopted an amendment from Representative Tom Udall and Todd Platts. Uh, working with Congressman Mark Udall from uh, Colorado, which created a national renewable electricity standard requiring that 15 percent of our electricity come uh, from renewable sources uh, and efficiency by the year 2020. Uh, that was a big moment on the House floor, uh, and it portends for big things to happen before the end of this year. That completes the opening statement from the Chair. I now turn and recognize the ranking member of uh, the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It shouldn't surprise you to know that I support the development of renewable energy, including wind, solar, biomass, and hydroelectric power. Week after week, Republicans on this panel have said that technology provides the only real path to a global warming solution. We can't stop using energy but we can develop ways to create energy without releasing CO2. It may also not surprise you to know that I voted against government regulations requiring power companies to include renewable energy as one of its sources. So how can I say I am for renewable energy and then vote against requiring it? The answer is simple, because I firmly believe that if we are to find realistic global warming solutions, Congress should encourage technological competition, but must not pick who wins and who loses. By requiring electric utilities to generate a portion of their energy through renewable sources, the government is picking the winners, and in these cases the winners will be certain types of renewable sources. The problem with a renewable portfolio is that it emphasizes the means and not the ends. After all, the goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in July, the House passed legislation that requires utilities to use renewable sources to produce 15 percent of its electricity. I am skeptical of most regulation, but this one is particularly onerous because it discounts the progress some electric utilities have made 
and only because they use methods not favored by certain congressional leaders. One utility that would fall prey to this terrible idea is the Southern Company. And I am happy to welcome Mr. Chris Hobson, the company's senior vice president for research and environmental affairs. Should this bad policy ever become law, utilities that are able to meet the renewable standards would presumably produce 15 percent of its electricity without producing any CO2. And that would be progress. But not for the Southern Company. As Mr. Hobson will testify, 18 percent of the electricity generated by the Southern Company today emits no carbon dioxide whatsoever. So the Southern Company has nothing to worry about with these regulations, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, the Southern Company has big worries, and so should all of its ratepayers. With 15 percent of its electricity generated by nuclear power and another 3 percent from hydropower, Southern Company has already met the emissions cuts required these proposed regulations seek to create. But because the utility doesn't employ the use of wind turbines or solar panels, it will be forced to pay government fees for its failure to comply. And that will likely cost the company a billion dollars a year, which will be passed on in every ratepayer's monthly bill. Like all smart energy utilities, the Southern Company is researching its renewable energy options. But in the areas in the South it serves aren't conducive to many forms of renewable energy. The South has simply too much clouds and not enough wind if these regulations come to pass. And Southerners will literally pay the price for their geographic location. Congress should be promoting technological solutions to global warming, not picking which technology is its favorite. That isn't a path to a solution. It's only a path to higher electricity bills. Additionally, I'd like to welcome Governor Ritter to the committee. The governor is here to talk about Colorado's new energy economy and its goals of a 20 percent renewable standard. A recent report commissioned by the state legislature shows that Colorado does have an energy economy that produces 70,000 jobs, $640 million in tax revenue, and then adds $22.9 billion to the state's economy. Of course, that energy economy comes from the oil and gas sector then I suspect renewable energy has far less impact on Colorado. So I am curious to hear how the governor plans to nurture a new energy economy without slowing an oil and gas sector that appears to be a foundation to the state's economy. And I thank the chair. Great. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Now, we have um, the governor can only stay until 10 o'clock. And uh, Okay. What I, I have no plans to uh, speak longer than uh, even a portion of that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and and, and I, I, uh, uh, this gentleman from uh, Oregon is recognized. Thank you, and I appreciate your admonition, and I will try and be brief and to the point. But this is one of those rare occasions when I disagree with my respected friend, the ranking Republican member as when he equated the amount of electricity that was consumed by a country as progress. Uh, here, uh, I couldn't disagree more with uh, our action that we took with the leadership of uh, our friend from Colorado, Mr. Udall, you, Mr. Chairman, our speaker, in establishing a national renewable portfolio standard. We are not about picking winners and losers. We are about setting a framework for a broad effort to in incent uh, the appropriate uh, range of options for generating energy for the future. I look forward to hearing from Governor Ritter and uh, our friend Mr. Udall, because part of what they have done is create their own renewable portfolio standard uh, approved overwhelmingly by their uh, voters. We are in the process of doing this state by state across the country. The question is whether the Federal Government will catch up and be able to do it as well. And that is why I am pleased to welcome uh, Nancy Floyd, who will be speaking in a moment, because uh, she, as the founder and managing partner of Anth Power, uh, the first venture capital uh, com uh, company in the world dedicated to these uh, renewable energy uh, technologies, are going to help operationalize it. But I think 
as part of her testimony, which I hope my friend from Wisconsin will have a chance to listen to, the inconsistent policies of the Federal Government have lost our lead in areas like wind and solar. And we need a full range of consistent Federal policies like a renewable portfolio standard to be able to give the proper incentive. Um, I think Florida is still the sunshine state, uh, but we heard some of our colleagues concerned that they couldn't deal with solar. Um, I think it is time for us to have a wake-up call. I appreciate your scheduling this hearing and being able to hone in on how we will accomplish that. And I hope I have allowed time for the Governor to speak before 10. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I would ask the other members if they wouldn't mind that we allow the Governor to testify at this time, and, uh, and then we will, uh, when he has completed his uh, testimony, uh, uh, have the other members then make their opening statements. And we will begin by recognizing our colleague from the State of Colorado, uh, Mark Udall. Uh, Mark, along with his cousin Tom and uh, Todd Platts, gave the leadership and the debate which we had in the first week of August on the House floor on increasing uh, the national standard for renewables and efficiency to 15 percent per year by the year 2020. Um, he has been a leader throughout his entire career going back to the Colorado State House on the issue. Welcome, uh, Mark. And whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the, in the spirit of uh, assuring that the Governor has plenty of time to tell you about the great uh, successes in Colorado, I would like to ask that the full uh, text of my introduction, which is uh, noteworthy and, and uh, <laughs> full of a lot of substance, be included in the record, and I will shorten my introduction to the Governor. So we'll Without objection, we will set aside uh, one full textbook for that. So. Let, let, let me uh, just tell you that the, the Governor is uh, widely respected and popular in Colorado, and that is in many ways because he's, uh, in his short, he's a short time in office, less than a year, he has uh, reformed many of our natural resource policies, which require us to uh, be responsible and how we develop and protect our air and our water and our land. He is uh, working towards creating a 21st century transportation system, which Mr. Blumenauer would be uh, very interested in, I know. And he is also focused on uh, statewide health care, which, of course, we need to do here at the Federal level. Uh, and he has made a real uh, point of making sure that we have the best uh, K-12 through and higher education levels. Um, but most importantly, he has quickly established uh, the State of Colorado as a leader in renewable energy by doubling uh, our State's renewable electricity standard. In uh, 2004, we were the first voters in the country to establish a renewable electricity standard, which was known as Amendment 37. And we did that in a bipartisan way. I was fortunate uh, to chair the uh, committee, the statewide committee, with our Republican Speaker of the House, Lois Bradley. And uh, then this year, in bipartisan fashion, our legislature doubled uh, the RES requirement to 20 percent by 2020, I believe, and Governor Ritter signed that uh, into law. So I am very pleased he is here today to tell you about the successes in Colorado and what we envision for the future, not just in Colorado, but for this great country of ours. So it is a real honor to uh, introduce uh, the Governor of Colorado, Bill Ritter. Great. Whenever you are ready, please begin, Governor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you can push that button down there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Markey, Representative Sensenbrenner, members of the committee, Representative Udall. It is uh, really a pleasure to be able to be here and uh, be invited to testify, and so I thank you for that. I also have written remarks that I would be asked to be entered as part of the record, and I will make brief remarks in lieu of that. Um, I want to offer uh, Congressman Udall uh, a thank you for his introduction and also for all the work that he has done that relates to Colorado's own um, energy economy issues and natural resource issues. He is a strong partner in our efforts, and I will talk a little bit about what we call the new energy economy. As Re Representative Udall referenced, we passed Amendment 37 uh, by an overwhelming margin actually in 2004, and I think at the time it was the first voter-led initiative that established a renewable energy standard. And it is really uh, about that that I am here to testify today, about the efforts that we have made since uh, I have been inaugurated as the Governor of the State. But so many of those things had their foundation in Amendment 37. And it really goes back to the conversations we had then when our largest utility in the State came in and, and really opposed the passage of Amendment 37 for many of the same reasons you hear uh, that people are against um, 
uh, either a Federal standard or other State uh, renewable energy standards, uh, things like it would cost the ratepayers uh, uh, the added amount of money that we can't get to the place that we are setting the standard. We set it at 10 percent by 2015. When we proposed a bill this year that ultimately was passed by both houses and I signed into law, our biggest ally, really our biggest ally, was the same utility who had opposed Amendment 37. And that is because they found uh, how easy, really, in a sense, it was to begin making their way toward the standard that was set by the voters initially. Remember, it was 10 percent by 2015. We will get to 10 percent by the end of this year. So eight years early, we are going to get to that 10 percent mark in Colorado. And um, we have uh, ongoing testimony by that utility that talks about in front of our PUC, we will come in and talk about least cost options as part of our Utility Commission's uh, standard when they are asking how we are going to generate electricity. Um, the least cost options actually include the generation of wind as a part of that. We have seen uh, that utility come in now and be an ally in us resetting the standard at 20 percent by 2020. We passed it through both houses. I signed it into law. That utility, uh, like I said, was a partner in that, but our, our rural electric associations initially have been carved out of Amendment 37. Um, when we uh, proposed this uh, House Bill 1281, that was our new standard, 20 percent by 2020, uh, all but one REA in the State came in and again supported our efforts and were, I think, happy to do so. Uh, so we were able to reset the standard. What we have seen is this, and the reason I think, uh, to your point, um, Mr. Sensenbrenner, about why we call it the new energy economy, we have a very robust traditional energy economy. The extractive industries, oil, coal and gas, they are a big part of our economy. But we called it the new energy economy because it melds the two things and it has absolutely been significant in economic development for us to focus on renewable energy economy in tandem with that. Uh, people who view these two economies as one in lieu of the other, I think, are wrong to do that, and especially in a State like Colorado where there is robust extractive industry activity, industrial activity going on. But we were missing a real opportunity prior to our setting the mandate. And, and since setting the mandate, some of the things that have happened have been, I think, just fairly significant, and especially to some areas where we needed to add value to the economy, quite frankly. In the East, we have wind farms being built. Since, uh, since I've been inaugurated, we've uh, had groundbreaking on several different wind farms up and down the eastern plains. We have one of the largest solar plants in the country being built in our San Luis Valley where there's, there's a lot of sun. Uh, we have great geothermal possibilities, but we've also uh, been able to participate in the vertical part of that industry. A Danish company built its first manufacturing plant in Colorado, Vestas Blades, so it's manufacturing those rotor blades. Just recently had another announcement about a company, AVA, that's going to co-locate with Colorado State University and build manufacturing plants for a thin film photovoltaic. Uh, those kinds of things are, are our ability to take this renewable energy economy and create jobs both in, in, in uh, agricultural areas but also in manufacturing areas and to really add value to an economy that in many respects, as I said, needed that to happen. Uh, if you think about the consequences environmentally, which are all positive, if you think about the things that we do with respect to economic development and you add to that the part that we can play in over time energy independence as a country, uh, we really do believe that it has this great trifecta impact on us as a State, certainly, and really on us as a country. And, and finally, I would say this, that I, to uh, Mr. Um, Blumauer's point with respect to what the States are doing, the Western governors, the national governors, we are paying attention to this issue. And, and in many respects, when we get together, it is the thing we talk about most. Education is right up there. But we talk about the things that we are doing as States, and, and it very much has to do with the frustration of there not being a Federal policy that supports us in the way we do. Finally, I would say this. In a coal-producing State, we are also about clean coal. And we really believe that this body, the, the Federal Government, needs to do all they can to incent the development of clean coal, both research and technology and either production tax credits or investment tax credits. The Western Governors, I think, would say it is our number one goal as an association. So, again, thank you so much for the, the opportunity to be here and the opportunity to testify this morning, Mr. Chairman. Great. Uh, thank you, Governor, so much for uh, being here. Now, to the uh, members, I think in order to accommodate everyone, 
Uh, what we'll do is we'll go to a round of three-minute questioning, because the governor does have to leave by um, uh, 10 o'clock. And then if there's time left over, we'll just keep uh, uh, revolving uh, around the uh, committee members uh, with uh, perhaps even a shorter period of time so that everyone can have an opportunity. So the chair will recognize himself now for a round of uh, three minutes of questions. Let me, let me ask you, uh, Governor, about your electricity rates in the state of Colorado. How has this move to 10 percent um, renewable electricity uh, affected the um, rates for your consumers? I think um, there has been statements by our a regulated utility that uh, actually the rates of either uh, the, the cost of producing electricity has either been brought down by our renewable portfolio standard or remain relatively the same. Uh, we know that there is a difference between the rate at which you can buy a kilowatt hour for coal um, and, and, and there is a difference between that and something like, let's say, solar. Uh, we see the price of solar coming down as the technology gets better. Our conversations with people who are involved in solar would say that it is coming down pretty significantly. We understand that as it relates to coal, um, if we go to gasification or if we find you know, a technology that can strip off CO2 at scale, at the altitude that we have with the type of coal that we have, that that is going to uh, likely increase the price of coal um, and will be competitive with solar. But as it stands, particularly with respect to wind, wind, natural gas and coal are all there at a place where they are competitive and it has, not, um, it has not impacted the rates that uh, our consumers are paying. And again, uh, the PUC looks at this, they, keep, they pay attention to this, and it was uh, something that we very much paid attention to as we move through this renewable portfolio standard. Now, with regard to the rural parts of uh, Colorado, um, could you talk about the impact that this new momentum is having and could have on rural Colorado? Well, Florida Power and Light uh, is building one of the largest wind farms in the northeast part of the state. I was just part of a, an opening, a ribbon cutting last week where uh, we put 75 uh, megawatts online that will produce energy for 220,000 homes. We already had 108 uh, turbines on land just uh, the east of that. British Petroleum is building um, one wind farm and has talked about additional wind farms. And, each time they do that, imagine if a farmer, the, there is a, a place in the southeast part of the state, 108 turbines, they only have 68 acres out of production. And uh, they can make a choice between either taking a per turbine lease um, where they are paid by the turbine, or they can decide that they take a percentage of the electricity produced and the cost of that. Um, if they take a per turbine, do you know what the average farmer or rancher receives in compensation? Uh, it is my sense it is uh, somewhere around four to 5,000. And actually, we are joined by some Coloradans here, uh, one of whom has eight turbines on his land. We just talked about that. The newest contracts now are giving you the alternative of one or the other. And I think maybe it is uh, it's either $3,500 uh -huh. or the cost of the uh, or the uh, percentage of the electricity that is generated and the price that they are uh, earning for that. And it is one of the two. Uh, and so it is still significant. I mean, I, I know there is a farmer that is getting a $4,000 per lease turbine. And, and you know, if you have 100 turbines on your land and you only have 68 acres out of production, it doesn't take long to do the math and understand what value you are adding, yeah. not just to that farmer, but to these uh, counties and to their tax base. And that is very significant for us as a state. Great. My time has expired. I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, uh, thank you, Governor. I am curious about the transmission line siting issues because very frequently the places that are best for renewable energies, particularly solar and wind, are not where the people are. And I have noticed that uh, the wind resources appear to be in eastern Colorado. The solar resources occur, appear to be in southwestern and south central Colorado. Uh, I found in Wisconsin that people don't like transmission lines, you know, running through their property. Uh, how do you plan to deal with that? Thank you, Mr. Sensmitter. Uh, there is a couple of issues. One was just the availability of transmission, because we had always been told, especially during the campaign, when I was running, because we made renewable energy a big thing, they said, you know, an impediment is even building the transmission. And uh, we went to the REAs and we said to them, the Rural Electric Associations, what does it take? And they said, we really need to have bonding capacity to borrow against this. And we believe that there is this ability on our part to build out uh, the transmission if, in fact, we can get the bonding capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, when I just did this uh, 
ribbon cutting in the southeast part of the state last week. There are about 12 farmers who are involved either in having the turbines or in having some part of the mm -hmm. transmission uh, lines on their property. And uh, basically, the farmers in the, in the eastern plains understand the value to the economy of this and, and siting for transmission to date has not been a problem. Uh, we had, uh, there was a meeting in the southeast, the southern eastmost county. It is called Baca County. It is a very small, not a, not a terribly big, well populated county and 65 farmers showed up because they want to understand how they can be a part of this. So it has not been a problem for us. I, I do appreciate the point. And in the West, we have always had this issue. There are transmission lines that run across some places that are otherwise not inhabited. And so we had that experience, but we, I think, also understand uh, that with this renewable energy economy comes the need on our part to provide the transmission. We are talking to other states about a regional transmission grid that we think has to be a part of our thinking here. Um, but again, to date, siting wasn't the problem. It was thinking about how we pay for it going forward. Okay. And, we did, and we did two different things that it will help us build out transmission. Okay. I have one further question relating to traditional energy. Uh, XL Energy is proposing a coal-fired plant that uses some pretty significant uh, technology that reduces CO2 emissions and sequesters uh, a lot of the other ones. Do you support these technologies and would you support streamlining the permitting process uh, for those who wish to build this plant? Well, I, I certainly support the technology. And I mean, everybody that we speak to around issues of climate change will say, and we have had several meetings about this. I just met with the governors of Wyoming, uh, Utah, and West Virginia, actually, as coal producing states, to talk about where we are with respect to the technology and what we need from the Federal Government um, in either production tax credits or investment tax credits. But I, I very much support our going forward with uh, research and development and providing incentives for not just the research and development for building these projects to scale where the technology is proven, both in gasification and stripping off the CO2. So I, I, I believe it is something that, uh, that, sh that has to be a part of our energy portfolio as we go forward, and I would very much support the technology. As it relates to the permitting process, um, you know, as long as those things that, uh, that I think are still the responsibility of government, uh, air quality, water quality, and even with us, um, a fair amount of other issues around land use, as long as those things are, are still part of the process and thought about carefully, I, I would support us being able to do that in uh, a quicker fashion. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will uh, try and atone for jump, jumping the gun here by being short with just one question. Uh, Governor, you may have heard that uh, I am very interested in having the Federal Government be a partner with you by having sound, consistent, stable policies over time. I am wondering if you have any comment on the impact of uh, if we are successful in establishing a renewable portfolio standard nationally, even if lower than your 20 by 20, uh, how that would impact your efforts to uh, evolve your new energy technologies in Colorado. Does that help or would that uh, hinder your efforts? Yeah, it is my, my understanding that uh, any Federal RPS would uh, take into account what States are doing as well, do, already doing. And I, I have to think that it can only help. And, and here is why. States are begging for involvement by the Federal Government to have some kind of a consistent and coherent national policy that looks at conservation, looks at efficiency, looks at renewable, looks at clean coal, looks at what the portfolio is going to be like going forward, but has us really speaking with one mind and one voice. Uh, we have had people from uh, the Prime Minister of Sweden visited um, Governor Schwarzenegger, and visited Colorado, visited me to talk about what we as a state are trying to do in moving forward. And I think, you know, as we talk about climate change and the issues around climate change, that we are best as a country when we speak with one voice around something that has such an overarching, um, an overarching impact on the rest of the world. And, and so I think that as it relates to an RPS, that is just one part of the conversation, but it is terribly helpful in having the broad conversation as a country with the rest of the world. Thank you. And I yield back. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governor, thank you for being here. And following on with what Mr. Blumenauer said, uh, I, states like mine, Tennessee, are not, uh, when you look at a uh, renewable energy portfolio and requirements for different states, mine are not good areas for wind and solar. And you've referenced the Governor's Association and the meetings that you all and the conversations that you have there. I think we would all be interested in what you would see as how to have flexibility within some requirements and within that portfolio. And I would just like to, Mr. Chairman, ask for the record that those uh, recommendations be given to us so that we could see what you all, you've referenced some of yours and some of your benchmarks. And I think as we look at applications at the federal level, we would enjoy hearing from you. Thank you. Move forward and from the Governor's Association. Um, actually, thank you very much. And, and I think uh, you will see the National Governor's Association is making um, energy and energy issues going forward the issue for us to discuss uh, this coming year. And um, Governor Pawlenty from Minnesota is our chair and has decided that his initiative will be about around our energy future. Okay. And so it is uh, a very helpful discussion to have all the governors in the room and talk about what we as a country can do state by state by state. Uh, the Western governors, Democrats and Republicans alike, very much share a view about how we as producing states and consuming states can really we think make a difference with this federal conversation by uh, talking about this wide portfolio that we should be thinking about and really, I think, looking for assistance where research and development is concerned regarding clean coal. Great. Let me, let me move on in that vein. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the reaction of the public. And in um, some of the reading we've done with what you've done, you've promoted the establishment of E85 stations in your state. I want you to talk for just a minute about the infrastructure and if you plan to use pipeline or if you're going to use fuel tankers, which I would imagine is what you're going to do for that distribution and then how that would affect your interstate uh, shipping and road congestion. And then also with the production of ethanol in your state. Um, as you're looking at that, water resources, we continue to hear about the impact on water resources and drought conditions and what the impact would be on your uh, corn production. And not only that, but access to water and water bills. You know, as we look at constituents and how they are impacted by policy, so many times, and even in Tennessee, in my area, we've had a serious drought this year, and we have seen the impact of availability of water, access to water, and then the uptick in the bills, and I would be interested in how you were going to, to address that. Okay. And I yield back, Mr. Okay. Chairman. General lady's time has expired. The, uh, the witness will please Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as it relates to E85, we um, have, uh, I think 13 pumps or we had at the beginning of this year. GM, General Motors came in and uh, with us, uh, we made an agreement to quadruple the number of E85 pumps. So that's a corn-based ethanol. What I will tell you is this, we have significant research happening in Colorado. Colorado School of Mines, uh, Colorado State University and the University of Colorado formed a collaboratory. We did and state government formed a collaboratory with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And I think if you talk to the researchers, most of them would agree that uh, while it is important for us to focus on E85 and corn-based ethanol as a transition, it is um, not necessarily the uh, fuel of the future. It's not the biofuel of the future, that there's a great deal of research going on with respect to other kinds of biofuels that may well be the new energy economy's fuel. However, it is important that we have this idea about this transition fuel, this, this corn-based ethanol, so the public begins to become aware of it, so that automobile manufacturers begin to respond to it. And whether, the, whether it's a hybrid car uh, or whether it's some type of a biofuel, we'll, we'll see. But we know right now that uh, corn ethanol is giving us this ability to think about it in terms of the transition. We just opened up a, a biodiesel plant made purely from sunflower oil in the southwestern part of our state, and again, a great economic development for that little county. 
Water is an issue in Colorado. We are an arid state. We are at the seventh year of a seven-year drought. So, so we very much pay attention to it, and I think that is why some of the research that is happening as well at the, those universities and at the collaboratory involves drought-resistant kinds of crops. Cellulosic ethanol is what a lot of people talk about as part of the future, but uh, we are very mindful uh, that these kinds of policies do have impact. They have impact on corn prices, which uh, in turn have impact on beef prices, and we are a cattle producing state. So we are watching this all very carefully, understanding that uh, this is not a place where you do pick winners and losers. And we are very much trying to put in place policies that are science and technology neutral, but that still inspire us to do what we need to do as a country to move in that direction around just a biofuel that I think responds to the concerns that you address. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Washington State, Mr. Hensley. Um, thank you. First, I want to thank you for your leadership in Colorado. Thanks for sending us. Mr. Udall has done a great job for us federally. And we followed Colorado with the second RPS by popular vote. Right. And we, uh, we, we sort of stole the playbook from you, and we appreciate your efforts on that. I want to ask you about feed in tariffs as an adjunct to renewable portfolio. Uh, I have been talking to some folks who suggested that having a, a program where you pay a certain, a given amount for the amount of energy that is produced from solar or wind has some advantages um, compared to renewable portfolio standard for next generation technologies. I have heard some people suggest that a renewable portfolio standard is really good for sort of the next, the next uh, technology, but really not maybe so good for the second, third, or fourth, that may be just a little behind as far as the cost development. Do you have any thoughts about that? Some people suggested maybe we ought to look at a feed-in tariff as, as well to help some of those second, third, and fourth generation technologies coming on. Um, mostly in my, this is in my conversations with uh, wind producers where the technology has actually gotten much better. Right. Um, we are in that next generation of wind production right now, and we are experiencing that in Colorado with the change in the size of the blades and the, I think the, the way the turbines are working. and that happened without a fee and tariff. Um, uh, likewise, as it relates to solar, um, we are we're talking to people, the solar producers, about concentrated solar power and that being sort of the next generation of solar technology. I myself think uh, think of fees and tariffs th this way: that if they happen, they should have to they have to happen at this level, at the uh, federal level. That you have to think about it, and you really have to develop an understanding that at a state, you put yourself in a real hole if you try and do it state by state by state. Uh, same, really, in some respects, with other kinds of issues that that impact this carbon trading is one of those yeah. issues that it's hard to do even region by region, uh, but might might be workable. But but with respect to fees and tariff, we have not. Um, I have not seen um, how they would incentivize differently than it's already happening these renewable portfolio standards. Right, I appreciate that. Um, by the way, we're at least I'm very excited about solar thermal. You know, we've seen that there's going to be some announcements next week actually about some solar thermal contracts that are going to blow people away. Uh, I think it'd be very exciting for us. And I will crow about your success in the second version. I just got to write a book about clean energy called Apollo's Fire. You didn't get in it, but in the sequel, I want to make sure you get in it because of your success. Thanks for I your leadership. I appreciate the, uh, the hopeful mention. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to pursue the issue of geothermal. I, I represent Eastern Oregon, about 70,000 square miles. And I was down to Oregon Institute of Technology recently and was told by some folks there and elsewhere that up to two-thirds of Oregon's electric energy production could come from geothermal sources, given that uh, now there is technology you can produce electricity at 163 degree water. And um, I am just curious how we pursue that geothermal and your views on this, because a lot of those resources reside on public lands. As you know, I don't have to tell you, in the West, over half of my state is uh, under public ownership, and it is very, very restrictive to get in there. And yet some of those resources may hold great promise for us to have a, a very carbon neutral or, or uh, carbon offsetting potential for electricity. Do you encounter those problems in Colorado? And if so, what advice could you give this Congress in terms of accessing those resources? The, um, 
State of Colorado, we believe, has the fourth best potential for geothermal of the 50 states, and so I don't know where we fall. It's uh, got to be below Oregon. It just has to be. Uh, well, if you think about it, Steamboat Springs, Glenwood Springs, all those nice. big cities we named after springs, uh, we, we did for a reason, because we have a lot of, we have such great geothermal potential. Um, and, and so it's like many other things, we ask how do we incentivize the building out of that, because as far as I know, geothermal uh, is not uh, something that we have tapped nearly like we've begun to tap wind and even solar and, and something that we intend to do. We're, we're looking at the possibility of uh, supplying power to our governor's residents with geothermal because it's the technology is there and it's easy enough right. to tap. The question is how we do it on, on public lands, and I think that that has to be, again, decisions made back here. Uh, we have 23 well, million acres of land in Colorado and would very much enjoy, I think, uh, a federal policy that incentivizes it the way we have incentivized I, uh, wind power through the investment tax credits. And I concur because I think it can be clean energy. I think it can be done in an environmentally appropriate way. The question is, can we get through the hurdles that are in front of us in every other sort of energy development or, or use on Federal land? The final question I would have involves uh, this issue of biomass. And I know, having chaired the Forestry Subcommittee and my friend and colleague from Colorado, Mr. Udall's involvement in forestry issues, don't you face some severe forest health issues, part of which may be driven by increased temperature, which bring about drought and, and change structures? And don't you think the Federal Government should be doing more to allow us to get in on, on the different forests and thin them out quicker and replant and restore after fires and use the, geo, or use the biomass for energy production? Yes. <laughs> I mean, we, we really have a serious pine beetle infestation yes, I know you do. problem in Colorado, very serious lodgepole pine. They were all about 80 years old, and that, that increased sort of the infection rate right. uh, from tree to tree to tree. Yeah. As a result, we have entire forests that are uh, damaged and infected. And, and the fire danger is elevated slightly uh, right now. The needles have turned red. But as those trees fall over in the next 15 to 20 years, the fire danger is very much exaggerated. And so uh, I have spoken with the U.S. Forest Department. I spoke with Mark Ray, the Chief of the Forest Service, and, and asked them this question, this, this very question, how can we begin to clear that land and reduce the fire danger over time and use the wood for woody biomass to generate electricity? I, I had some yeah. legislation last session that uh, we could get, could have gotten that done if we could have gotten it through the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Great, great minds think alike here. Uh, gentleman from uh, uh, Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Udall, um, for, for all your work. And, Governor, thank you for being here. I, I just have one question. And uh, I, I'm from Missouri, and we do have uh, RPS um, put in place voluntarily, and it's 11 percent by 2020. Um, what chances do you think we have of meeting those goals voluntarily? I uh, mean, we, we. I think the 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 the, um, the effort put into establishing this w uh, was uh, was good. People were genuinely interested in in trying to um, make some dramatic changes uh, in in the way we uh, handle uh, electricity. And but um, a voluntary program. Uh, does not appear, based on, on what is happening so far, uh, to have the, the same amount of uh, juice that a, that a uh, uh, government um, mandated program would have. So uh, am I off? Uh, what, do you, what, do you, uh, what, what do you say based on what is happening in Colorado? Well, I, thank you. Uh Mr. Cleaver and I, I would have to say that uh, our mandate that was voter passed really uh, showed that the leadership was coming from the people, but they wanted a mandate. They wanted the utilities to have to do this, and that you know, was three years ago. It was 10 percent by 2015. I suspect if we had said voluntarily we would like you to get there, that the result would be different than us looking at that 10 percent by the end of this year and achieving that goal. And, and I am not a person who thinks that across the board mandates are the right thing, but this is too important a conversation for us to not undertake and undertake now because of what we face. If we don't make the right, uh, I think, transition 
to clean energy and, and to renewable technologies and conservation and efficiency. And that is really part of my point is it is part of this other bigger conversation, but some of it has to come through mandates, I think, to force the conversation. And then what we found were our biggest opponents became our biggest allies when they understood the benefits of getting there. So I, I appreciate it. And just a moment of, of privilege. I, uh, met Representative Cleaver when he was the mayor of Kansas City. He came to Denver and I was the district attorney and he was a wonderful and gifted uh, speaker and helped us in many respects form some public policy around responding to violence. And it is just great to see you again, Mr. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. for Thank you. allowing me that point of privilege. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for coming to, uh, to see us this morning, Governor. And I want to echo some comments I have already heard. California has ad adopted renewable portfolio standards uh, and the utility companies resisted at first. Uh, and we found that once they uh, got on board, they met the uh, goals uh, early and were having to increase our, per our perfor performance standards uh, numbers and they are willing to go out after those. So it is very common to see that sort of behavior. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Walden for bringing up the comment about geothermal energy. That is very effective for some states like Colorado. So whatever we can do to, to uh, help that. Um, I have a couple of questions. How large an impact has the sales tax exemption been on both the production uh, of renewable energy and on the state uh, revenues? The uh, sales tax exemption, uh, Mr. McInerney, was just passed in this uh, in this last session, actually, there were some pur uh, power purchase agreements where they believed that it was in place and there was some question about whether it was or was not. Uh, it has been a big impact in having, I think, wind companies decide to build there going forward mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they, they really believe that it can impact the margin sufficiently enough that uh, this does uh, become, you know, again, remain competitive with natural gas and coal. So. Uh, it was. It, it has had a big impact on uh, decisions. We've met with the companies, with uh, the companies that are making decisions. Uh, Florida Power and Light, I think, uh, may well have made a decision that went the other way had uh, we decided not to put in place that sales tax exemption in law. But you don't have a, an idea of how that's going to impact the state revenues. Well, no, not until it is all said and done. But what I can tell you is the so Florida Power and Light is putting in, uh, we think it is the second biggest wind farm in America and uh, 300 and some turbines. And if we go back to the price that these farmers earn, the difference it makes, um, and even what will uh, we think be the production that will happen at the Wind Blade Manufacturing Company in Colorado as a result of that, all of those things uh, add just so significantly to the economic activity around that that it is significant. Does Colorado, does Colorado have its own production tax credits and investment tax credits uh, statewide? It is just this sales tax exemption for the manufacturing of equipment that is used to produce renewables. That is what we have, sir. Um, in the time remaining, could you describe how the performance contracting works on state buildings? Um, again, uh, the answer is yes, and it is new. I can answer how it works, but it is very new for us. And so we passed performance contracting on state buildings, and, and I signed an executive order that is a greening of government executive order. And um, we, will, uh, we will look to um, the build out of, of uh, buildings that create energy efficiencies, that create energy conservation as a part of it, that meet certain LEED standard. And uh, we hope at the end of the day, a LEED's gold standard for all new state buildings and that that will all be part of the performance contract that goes on going forward as a result of our executive order and the legislation that we passed around that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, great. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Um, Governor, could you just, uh, as you leave, give us, uh, give us your advice to the other states. Give us your advice to the other governors, to the other utilities like your utility that it initially was hesitant to embrace this new vision and, uh, uh, and this whole concept of NIMBY or bananas, you know, build absolutely nothing anywhere <laughs> near anybody. Um, uh, what has happened in your state? What recommendation do you have to other states and utilities in other states? We are a state for a lot of reasons uh, that is very sensitive to climate change. We have two of our three 
biggest industries, uh, tourism and agriculture, that are both very closely tied to not just the amount of water uh, that we uh, see or the amount of rainfall, but really the kind of rainfall. I mean, it, it matters that the precipitation is snow instead of rain in the mountains. And even as it relates to our agricultural industry, um, we are very, very sensitive to, to rainfall. And so I think that may be one of the reasons that in Colorado, um, a state like Colorado, in the last two years, we have seen a 20-point shift in how people think about climate change. And that has produced in our state the ability to have this really serious conversation about our energy future, both as it relates to our production, but also as, a, as it relates to consumption. And we think about our kids and our grandkids, and, and we ask the question, what is it going to be for them in 25 or 30 years if we don't make decisions today? about our energy future. And, and so that is, I think, provided the impetus for our initial Amendment 37 and then the ease with which, really in many respects, ease in that um, there was just not great resistance from the corners you might have expected the resistance to come from. And so I think it is important to have the conversation about a renewable portfolio in the context of this larger conversation about climate change and really about global warming and about our responsibility as citizens of the state or of the country in doing something to address it. Um, and then to say what are the possibilities in this state and to have a, a conversation that looks and borrows experiences from other states. But every region in this country has some level of renewable energy. Uh, regional transmission grids uh, for those states that are concerned about their lack of renewables, we think a regional transmission grid is absolutely something that we must think about in order to respond to the needs of those states that feel they don't have sufficient renewables to, to, uh, to have a portfolio in place like we do in Colorado. But I think the most important thing is that we need to do it. And we have to do it as a part of larger efforts around efficiencies and conservation and clean coal investments. Uh, we, and, 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 you know, using natural gas as well, uh, that uh, burns less carbons. All that has to be a part of our going forward. But if we miss the opportunity around renewables, uh, we really miss a significant opportunity to uh, make a difference on the environment and I think um, have a real uh, miss the opportunity for us as a country to do something that uh, can really move us towards energy independence at a quicker rate. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Um, Congressman John Hall from the State of New York has just arrived. We promised the Governor he would be out of here in two more minutes. Do you have a question you would like to pose to him in that two-minute period? Uh, no, thank you. Just thank you for the work that you do and for being here. And uh, I am sorry I am late. Great. No, no problem. Thank you, sir. Absolutely, Absolutely not. Governor, your testimony was incredibly impressive. And oh, your State you. is doing your leadership, uh, Mark Udall's. Uh, leadership. It is uh, it's a real beacon for our country and a, a standard that I think uh, we should set for ourselves as a nation as well. We thank you for um, being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mark. Uh, now, um, what, what, what uh, we agreed at 9 o'clock was that any member who wished to make an opening statement at this time uh, would be recognized for that purpose. Uh, I, I look uh, to the majority side and uh, look for anyone who might seek recognition for that purpose. A um, uh, gentleman from uh, New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just uh, briefly open by saying that to combat global warming, it is clear that in addition to dealing with, with what comes out of our tailpipes, we must also address the pollution from our power plants. The environmental logic of converting from relying on fossil fuels to climate-friendly renewables is clear and compelling. I am proud that my State of New York has been a leader in this transformation, adopting a 25 percent renewable standard by 2013. I am extraordinarily eager for Congress to follow suit by adopting the House passed RES and sending it to the President, who I hope will have the good sense to sign it into law. I would like to focus my questions today on breaking down the false choice between growth and green that some opponents of a renewable energy standard have tried to put forward. And I yield back the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, would the gentlelady like to make an opening statement? The uh, gentleman from California? Would the uh, gentleman from Oregon like to reclaim uh, no. the balance of his time? Well, then uh, we will turn to our second panel. And it is a very uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, and uh, we will uh, ask each of them to uh, make an opening statement of five minutes. And then we will turn to 
uh, the witnesses, I mean, the, the uh, members of the uh, select committee, uh, to ask questions of them. Our first witness um, uh, is uh, Nancy uh, Floyd. Um, uh, Congressman Blumenauer has already uh, referred to her uh, incredible resume. She is the founder and managing director of Nth Power. Nth Power was one of the pioneering clean tech venture capital firms and now has $400 million under management. As an active member of E2 Environmental Entrepreneurs, Ms. Floyd works to promote environmentally minded economic uh, development. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, Ms. Floyd also founded one of our country's first wind development uh, firms. Uh, we welcome you. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the committee. I I've been asked in my five minutes to um, address the current investment environment for renewables and what the passage of a, what a national renewable energy standard uh, how that would impact the investment community. And so I have four key points to make. Um, the first is that renewable energy markets are growing explosively. Uh, the global market last year grew 39 percent, so the market was $55 billion. And that growth is akin to the growth of the PC, the wireless, and the Internet industries during their heyday. And this, in the industry, is projected to quadruple in the next 10 years to $226 billion. And this has really been driven by a convergence of market factors, kind of, kind of a perfect storm, you know, resource depletion, aging infrastructure, energy security, and, and global warming. And the venture capital community and the investment community at large is responding to this opportunity. So 10 years ago, when I made my first venture capital investment in the sector, less than $50 million was being invested in new energy technology companies. Last year, $2.4 billion of venture capital, so one out of every $10, was invested in clean energy. And that number is not slowing down. So it's, it's no wonder that clean energy is being touted as the growth industry of the 21st century. So in, face, in, in the face of this growth, you know, the U.S., I'm sad to say, is losing jobs and investment capital to other countries. Of the top wind companies globally, only one is headquartered in the U.S., and that is GE. Of the top solar companies in the world, not one is headquartered in the U.S. And I guess to add salt to the wound, of the U.S. solar companies that have gone public recently, all of them are building manufacturing facilities outside the country. And a case in point is one of my portfolio companies, Evergreen Solar in, in Westboro, Massachusetts. Evergreen Solar took advanced solar technology out of MIT. They built their pilot production outside of Boston. And then in response to market demand, they wanted to build a manufacturing plant that was going to quadruple their output, and they wanted to locate it next to the market. That was Germany, not the U.S. And I know that everybody on this committee would like to see that Evergreen Solar's next major expansion is in this country, so the jobs stay in this country, and that we can increase the energy security of this country. So, a national renewable electricity standard would help make that happen because it would create a stable market in this country for Evergreen Solar's products. I think it's widely recognized that a renewable electricity standard is a fundamental market-making policy that is going to drive innovation, it's going to create jobs, it is going to create, uh, attract investment capital, and, and then there's a multiplier effect here. It's not just venture capital investment, but alongside venture capital in new energy technologies, you have the expansion, business expansion capital, you have the investment in manufacturing and in renewable energy projects. And I can tell you that those dollars on a, are on an order of magnitude greater than the $2.4 billion of venture capital that was invested in technology last year. So how have state renewable electricity standards impacted jobs and investment capital. A and I'm going to cite some statistics from my part of the world, which is 
California and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in all three states, California, Washington, and Oregon have passed renewable electricity standards. Uh, Oregon in the last legislative session, so just, uh, this, just this past summer. Two years ago, when I testified in front of the California State Legislature, I predicted that there would be $11 billion invested in renewable energy companies and projects by 2010, and I was wrong. More than $11 billion was invested in the two years since that renewable electricity standard was passed, and 50 percent of that capital was invested in California-based companies and projects. Last year, following the passage of the Renewable Electricity Standard in Washington State, Washington became the second state, uh, second largest state in terms of new wind development, adding almost 1,000 megawatts of new wind, which represented about $1.4 billion of capital investment. But you know, the industry is not just growing on the West Coast, it's growing nationally. Yes, 60 percent of my firm's portfolio are, are investments that are on the West Coast, but the rest of our portfolio is spread among 13 other states. And let me take Mississippi as an example. I have an investment in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm on the board, and so I spend a fair amount of time in the state. And I'm well aware of the concerns of the unequal distribution of renewable resource in this country. And we've heard the South doesn't have a lot of resource in terms of wind resource, but they've got a lot of biomass. A national renewable electricity standard could jumpstart a biopower industry in the South, or maybe an energy efficiency industry, because the South is the least energy efficient region of the country on a per capita electricity usage basis. And the EIA assumption. If you could oh, please summarize. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> renewable energy, it's big business, serious companies, serious investors. We can lead this growth sector. We have a chance to show leadership, and the investment community will step up. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Floyd. Uh, Mrs. Sloan, uh, our next witness is Mike Sloan, managing consultant of the Wind Coalition based in Austin, Texas. Mr. Sloan has been active in Texas renewable energy debates since 1997, including being part of the Texas PUC's renewable energy working group. Uh, he was appointed by then Governor George W. Bush to serve on the Texas Energy Coordination Council. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman and esteemed members. I am um, here to talk about the renewable energy standard in Texas and the related policies that have really helped make the wind industry there the premier market for wind power at least in the United States, if not the world. And to put it in a nutshell, one thing I want to sort of underscore from the Texas experience is that you can get quick results uh, with proper policies, significant results very quickly. Um, I want to skip over and talk about the level of wind that's going into Texas right now. Last year, Texas passed uh, California become the number one state for renewable energy. This is going from zero 12 years ago, where Texas literally had the lowest percentage energy use of, of renewables in the whole country, ranked 51st, even behind District of Columbia. So it's come a long way very quickly. And since last year, it has almost doubled its amount of wind power. This year, there's about $3 billion worth of wind uh, projects going into the state of Texas, about 2,000 megawatts. There's many more that are queued up, that have signed interconnection agreements, um, over 3,600 megawatts that are waiting to come on. Some fraction of those will not be able to come on because there's inadequate transmission infrastructure. If you look out further, there is a tremendous amount. Nearly 40,000 megawatts of wind are exploring coming onto the system in Texas, and there simply is not infrastructure or, or market to support that right now. Um, only a modest fraction of that will come on. So there's some work to do, uh, particularly on the, the infrastructure. And that's one new area that Texas has stepped in and really stimulated the market is a competitive renewable energy zone con concept. It's a proactive transmission planning regime. And the uh, state of Texas, uh, uh, an interim final order is expected this week. And it will designate eight different areas out in West Texas 
that will uh, have associated transmission plans that will support at least 10,000 to up to 26,000 megawatts of wind power. And this is from a single state. So it shows that things can move forward quite quickly. I will just mention that last year and again this year that the wind installations going into Texas are actually greater than the combined power plant additions from all other kind of power plants in Texas. It's very significant. Uh, on the policy side, how Texas has done that, it's a combination or a suite of different policies. Uh, first off, it did deliberative polls for education. Wanted to find out what do customers really want. And they found out that customers wanted renewables. This was done about 10 years ago. Then <clears throat> the RES was developed as a catalyst. It is a catalyst to uh, increase use of renewable energy. So that operates on the demand side, creates the demand. I will mention you can get diversity in a renewable energy standard, but you have to work on it. Uh, but there are some methods to do that. That was not what was done in Texas, though. That one is just the cheapest resource is what's done, so it's predominantly wind power. I will mention that within three years, going from a legislative concept to a billion dollars worth of, of projects on the ground took less than three years in, in Texas. So you can move very quickly. We also have a renewable energy credits program that's really helped stimulate the voluntary markets that make the renewable goals happen faster than uh, legislative requirements. A key thing about the competitive renewable energy zone has been pointed out, the, the good resources generally in rural areas, not where the people are. So you have to have infrastructure. Texas went through a serious contested case, over 50 parties were involved, and they made a decision that this is good for the state and they're gonna move forward with major transmission. Also very importantly is the role of incentives. If you're gonna have an RES that requires people to use it, it makes it much more appealing if you can have incentives that bring down the, the production cost to put it on par with other resources. That brings less opposition then from utilities that wanna use it if you can get these where they're competitive. And the production tax credit has played a critical role, the federal production tax credit in uh, wind power in the state of Texas. If you look when the production tax credit has expired, uh, both after 1999 and 2001, even in Texas, which is the best wind market in the country, there were zero megawatts installed the following year. So it's, it's really a combined package that works together uh, to make it happen. There's a couple lesson learns I wanna mention, and a, a real key one is that the renewable energy standard has expedited market action. Um, there's nine investor-owned utilities in Texas, and if you look at those that had a requirement under the RES and those that didn't, those that had the requirement voluntarily bought more renewable energy were those that didn't, didn't buy any voluntarily. And it just shows that it's really, it's a catalyst. You're forcing these companies to look at it. When they get more experience, they get comfortable with it and move on. It's had a lot of benefits. Uh, it's saving consumers money and really helping the rural areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sloan, very much. Our next witness, uh, Chris Hobson, um, is from the Southern Company. Mr. Hobson currently serves as the Southern Company's Senior Vice President for Research and Environmental Affairs. He has been with the Southern Company since 1973. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee, thank you for letting me have the opportunity to come to you and talk to you today about the use of renewable resources in the production of electricity. Uh, Southern Company serves 4.3 million customers in the states of Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi. We also provide competitive wholesale power in those four states and in the Carolinas. And we do that through a, a, a diverse portfolio of energy sources. We use coal, nuclear, natural gas, and renewable resources. And renewable resources have played an important role in the electric system that we operate in the southeast. Over 100 years ago, the first power plants in, South, in Alabama and Georgia were hydroelectric plants. And even today, those same plants provide important renewable sources of peaking power for our customers. Southern Company believes that the use of renewable resources for power generation can be increased, and we are working hard to make sure that that happens. We've been researching and testing various non-hydro renewable technologies for years, including biomass, solar, wind, and landfill methane. 
But in the southeast region, traditional renewable resources have their challenges. For instance, biomass is probably the most abundant non-hydro renewable resource in our part of the country. We've been testing ways to use biomass not only in co-firing in traditional coal-fired power plants, but also in repowering applications. And while the increase in the use of biomass has some promise, there are challenges. These include the high cost of handling and transporting biomass and dealing with its much lower heating value compared to fossil fuels. Additionally, the cost of using biomass will likely go up as the demand increases to meet the new cellulose ethanol requirements of the energy legislation. Department of Energy data shows that wind has very limited application for power generation in the southeast. Our written testimony shows a DOE map that shows a large absence of commercially available wind in our region. We have, however, done considerable research to see where wind resources might be available to us. We've worked with Georgia Tech on a study of offshore wind possibilities off the coast of Georgia. We've worked with TVA on the potential for wind located on mountain ridge tops in northern Georgia and eastern Tennessee. We're following up on those studies. But overall, we agree with DOE that the potential use of wind for power generation in the southeast is very limited. Our research and DOE data have also shown that the use of solar energy is limited in the southeast. It might not be readily apparent, but cloud cover and humidity lower the amount of solar radiation available for power generation in the southeast as compared to other areas of the country like the southwest. Solar's extremely high cost and its low availability for power production means that it will not be a large source of energy production. We're working with local governments to tap into sources for landfill methane. This will be a good source, resource for small applications for power generation. So while we are committed to increasing the role of renewable resources in our region, we think that federal mandates that would impose a single one-size-fits-all standard for renewables across the country is the wrong approach. Such an approach was added to the House bill this past summer, and that requirement mandates 15 percent of the utility's retail sales must come from a limited set of renewables such as wind, solar, biomass, and geothermal. If the utility doesn't have access to those renewable resources to, in order to meet the standard, we must either buy credits from developers in some other part of the country or more likely pay an alternative compliance payment to the federal government. This would be punitive to regions that don't have resources to meet such a standard, like the Southeast. Having to otherwise purchase credits from developers in other parts of the country or write checks to the federal government essentially imposes a tax on the customers of resource poor areas. As you can see in our written testimony, we've assessed the impacts of that 15 percent mandate on our customers. Since we don't have enough resources available to meet the requirement, we would have to comply by buying credits or making alternative compliance payments to the federal government that will result in our customers paying over $1 billion every year to comply. Alternatively, states have taken the lead in developing renewable programs. This approach has allowed states and local governments to take into account the regional differences on renewable availability. There are, 50, there are 25 states with renewable portfolio standards today, and those are tailored to make sense for those states, not for a country. It's significant that not one of the 25 state programs is consistent with provisions included in the House Energy Bill this summer. We operate in the state of Florida. The state of Florida is considering uh, renewable portfolio standards. We're working with that state for the development of a program that will make sense for Florida, but not necessarily make sense for other states. As I said, we're working to find ways to increase the use of renewables in a cost-effective way in our energy mix. We believe the current approach of federal incentives and funding for research and development, coupled with the development of state renewable programs, is the best way to bring renewables into the marketplace. This avoids a federal single standard that in resource poor areas of the country will simply mean a tax on electricity consumers. We don't think that's good energy or good environmental policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hobson, very much. Our next uh, witness is uh, Mr. Bob Reedy. He is the Director of Solar Energy Division of the Florida Solar Energy Center. Before coming to the Florida, Florida Solar Energy Center, Mr. Reedy spent 23 years with the Department of Electric and Water <coughs> Utilities uh, with the City of Lakeland, Florida. Welcome, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey. 
Thank you, Chairman Markey and members of the committee. Um, certainly for the chance to present my views, um, but more important for the leadership and initiative taken in this critical area. I would begin with a, a quote from a famous American. It, it goes like this. I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait till oil and coal run out before we tackle that. Well, that was Thomas Edison. That was in 1931. Uh, and Thomas Edison is easily considered uh, the father of the utility industry, as in Consolidated Edison and Commonwealth Edison, names of major utilities. The President's vision for the DOE's Solar America Initiative is changing the way we power our homes and businesses with a, with a goal for a cost-competitive photovoltaic industry by 2015. The great strength of this vision lies in the forces behind our discussion here today. We are well on track to see this happen. While I hail from the business of the sun, uh, today I will speak more from the perspective of a utility. You heard that I have spent most of my career with utilities. Let's take a look at the critical characteristics of energy supply from a utility perspective. And though I speak of solar energy, I will uh, acknowledge that many of these characteristics uh, occur with other renewable technologies. Consider risk. Ultimately, the generation decision is all about risk. Utilities are uniquely capital intensive with very long payback periods inherent in their business model. So how can such, such inherently risky ventures as a large coal-fired steam plant or a combined cycle gas turbine pass this risk criteria. These plants have many modes of mechanical failure, which I call technology risk. They face high risk of fuel shortages. They have large negative environmental impacts, which is a regulatory risk. And they present a technically unhealthy size, I call it technically unhealthy to the nation's grid, if you recall the blackout outages of uh, August of 03. So the good news I bring, the renewable energy technologies will surely lower the risk, even when evaluated on utility terms. So let's look at a few key elements of this risk profile. Economic feasibility is certainly first. U.S. Department of Energy cost projections show the cost of PV systems without, this is without financial incentives decreasing from a present U.S. national average of 32 cents per kilowatt hour to a future of 9 cents per kilowatt hour by 2020. And solar water heating, which is a fairly mature technology, so it is likely to remain flat in its, its cost projections, will, will come in less than 8 cents per kilowatt hour. Floridians now pay the utility about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. If one assumes that the cost of electricity from Florida utilities goes up by only 3 percent per year, in 2010 we will pay 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour, and by 2020 that will be 18 cents per kilowatt hour. So with no incentives or, in, or subsidies, in 2020 the energy generation systems on your roof and the energy efficiencies built into your home will cost half the utility rate. This is the, the customer perspective. The utility economies are proportionate. Nothing about the solar energy uh, system on a residential rooftop precludes the utility from owning and operating the system under an easement agreement and enjoying the, uh, the certain rate, rate basing capabilities of that system. So go green and, and have a guaranteed return. One major frustration to the solar industry is our persistent habit of comparing the base rate, base load energy rate of average generation costs of conventional generation to the peak period production costs of solar energy. I even did it uh, just in the paragraph above. In fact, utility generation costs during the daily summer peak, when that's when PV production is the highest, are about three times the annual generation cost. In a recent analysis of Florida generation costs, 
the Solar Energy Center found the total amortized 30-year life cycle cost of a, a new simple cycle gas turbine peaking unit to be around $180 per megawatt hour. If you could summarize your testimony. Yes, sir. And uh, the equivalent PV investment was less than $110 per megawatt hour. Solar systems are very reliable, predictable, and these are attributes highly valid, valued by a utility. And they are highly available, and we can discuss later the many ways that have not been realized to, to find solar resource. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, our next um, witness is uh, Dave Foster. He is currently serves as the Executive Director of the Blue Green Alliance, a partnership between the United Steelworkers and the Sierra Club. Uh, previously, he was the Director of, of the United Steelworkers District No. 11, uh, a region in the Midwest. Um, and uh, we thank you, sir, for being here. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. One of the most famous American industrialists of the 20th century, Henry J. Kaiser, who built an innovative manufacturing enterprise that included aluminum, steel, and shipbuilding, and created the healthcare delivery system that still bears his name, once observed that, quote, problems are just opportunities in work clothes. Solving global warming need not be the economic calamity that some are predicting. It is our view, in fact, that solutions to global warming, like renewable energy standards, will be the most important economic development tools of the 21st century. Evidence of that fact already surrounds us. In Germany, 1.4 million people are already employed in the environmental sector, and 40,000 people are employed in their wind en energy industry, that in a country that has only 20 percent of the wind resource of my home state of Minnesota. Economic studies that the steelworkers have supported over the past decade have shown repeatedly that well-crafted public policies that move us steadily and predictably toward global warming emission reductions will have a net positive impact on jobs, including in manufacturing. A 2002 study produced by the Center for Sustainable Economies and the Economic Policy Institute showed, for instance, that a menu of renewable energy investments, efficiency measures, and carbon reduction mandates in line with the Kyoto targets would have created a net increase of 1.4 million jobs in our economy, including increases in most manufacturing industries. And when these policies are accompanied with a modest border adjustment fee to ensure that the increase in energy costs in the U.S does not simply result in an export of manu American manufacturing to environmentally unregulated parts of the world, we have the policy tools to rebuild America's manufacturing infrastructure. Another study of component manufacturing in the renewable energy industry based on the rough equivalent of a 20 percent RES found that 850,000 jobs would be created with $160 billion of investment in manufacturing. This investment would ripple through 43,000 firms and revitalize the 20 states hardest hit by the decline in manufacturing in the last decade. Nothing, however, is quite as convincing as actually seeing the economic activity generated by the passage of renewable energy standards in the states. In 2004, Pennsylvania passed its 18 percent RES, and as a result, Gamesa, the Spanish wind turbine company, selected the certainty of the market demand in Pennsylvania created by that RES to build its first North American plants. Today, almost 1,000 steelworkers are employed by Gamesa outside of Philadelphia making wind turbines on the site of an abandoned U.S. steel mill. The company's products are sold out through 2009. Currently, in response to state energy standards, new wind turbine equipment plants have been built in six communities in my part of the country, North Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa, directly employing over 2,200 people. One of these companies, LM Glass Fiber, recently announced its agreement to build an additional plant in Little Rock, Arkansas, employing another 1,000 people, and another DMI announced a new power plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma, employing at least 450. Wind turbine installation is also creating jobs and bringing economic benefits to rural America. Mortensen Construction, based in Minnesota and one of North America's largest installers, now does 25 percent of its business in wind. Mortensen installs about 2,000 megawatts per year, employing almost 1,000 construction workers on 16 sites around the country. The company also reports that on an average 100 megawatt project, it spends between 15 and 20 million dollars within a 75-mile radius, thus bolstering local economies. 
The state of Minnesota has also calculated the value of wind energy production to rural and farm income, demonstrating that after initial capital costs of one to two million have been recovered, farm profits from renewable energy sales can rise to as much as $100,000 per year. Now, some might argue that in the face of growing evidence that renewable energy is now cost competitive with many forms of fossil fuel derived energy, the government should simply get out of the way and allow the market to work its wonders. That approach would, I fear, draw exactly the wrong lesson from the years of involvement at the state level in crafting these renewable energy standards. These laws are precisely what provided enough market certainty to allow market forces to perform their function. In the Twin Cities of Minnesota, I co-chair with the mayors of Minneapolis and St. Paul the new Green Manufacturing Initiative, a wide-ranging task force guided by the principle that investments in solving critical environmental challenges such as global warming represent strategic economic opportunities. The GMI has brought together over 100 representatives from XL Energy to the Sierra Club, from the Minneapolis and St. Paul Chambers of Commerce to the construction trades unions, from the investment community to state government, all with an eye to informing our mayors on how to capture the value of these new opportunities and make their cities world-renowned for the research and commercialization of renewable energy and efficiency processes, equipment, and systems. Economic transformations in our society have always bred winners and losers. It's an inescapable fact that when Henry Ford began to mass produce automobiles, the blacksmiths of the 19th century were replaced by the United Auto Workers of the 20th. But the America that emerged from that transformation was richer and fairer because of the courage of government to manage it properly. We can have the same outcome with the transformation to a clean energy economy if we choose to do likewise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Foster, very much. The uh, Chair will now recognize himself for a round of questions. Let me begin with you, Ms. Floyd. You say you have a, a biomass company, is it, in uh, Mississippi? It, no, it is not a biomass company. It is actually um, something that is an advanced metering company. But I spend a lot of time in the State. I see. I see. Well, uh, let me go back to you then, Mr. Hobson. Um, you have testified that, uh, that no matter how hard that your company works at this, you are not going to be able to squeeze more than 850 megawatts of renewables out of your region, um, which would appear to be less than 5 percent um, would constitute renewables. Meanwhile, the Department of Energy has looked at this and estimates that the Southeast region can meet its entire 15 percent renewable requirement through 2020 without having a single credit from uh, uh, either another utility or from the government. Um, and uh, that would come largely from uh, biomass. How do you respond to the Department of Energy's uh, study on that issue? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we are excited about the prospects for biomass in the region. Um, but we are also realistic about its limitations. Um, I, I'm not sure there is a full appreciation. I'm not, I, I'm not familiar with the particulars of that study, but I, I'm not sure that there is an appreciation um, for the amount of renewable resources, biomass, that is required to, to fuel a power plant or power plants capable of providing the energy resources of the Southeast. Our studies indicate that if you take a look at, at power plant locations, and you draw circles around how much of the how much of the biomass resources are required uh, to fuel that plant. It's a very small number of plants that can be built. We have looked at biomass plants in terms of sort of 50 megawatts, if you will, 50 megawatt uh, plant sizes, and it. Um, it is clear to us that the number of plants that can actually be sited in the southeast and supplied with the resources to provide that electricity is small. I mean, could you supply to the committee the analysis that the Southern Company has done that demonstrates that your region's resources limit you to producing uh, so much less than what the EIA and other studies indicate that you can? And could you uh, take the EIA study and tell us where the Bush, where the Bush administration is wrong in, in their analysis uh, of your region? Uh, sure, like sure to, we can. Then, then we can share that with the Bush administration uh, sure. as well. Uh, Mr. Foster, um, 
could you, uh, uh, well, let me come over here for a second. Ms. Floyd, uh, he's, he's pessimistic. How, tell us about wind in the southeast. Tell us about wind in Mississippi. Tell us about wind in other regions of the country other than uh, the west. And, other than the west. Yeah. Well, obviously there's good wind resource in the northeast. In the south, um, wind is limited because the good wind regimes are on protected properties, such as the Appalachian Mountains. I mean, one thing that has not been addressed is offshore wind. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, in Europe, where, uh, uh, where they are more advanced in offshore wind, you know, that is very much a possibility because in the southeast you have very shallow waters for quite a distance and offshore wind is very much a possibility. Um, so if we had a national scheme for uh, wind development offshore, that could offer significant potential for the southeast? That could offer significant potential, yes. Do you agree with that, Mr. Hobson? Uh, no, I don't, Mr. Chairman. And the reason is that the Southeast has a unique characteristic to it that the rest of the country or the rest of the world might not, and that is it, starts, it sits in, uh, in the pathway of major storms that come in in the form of hurricanes. And wind turbines are not, are not able to withstand even a very small Class III uh, hurricane. And so putting resources in huge investments in the Gulf region or even in the South Atlantic would be a huge risk. And, and, and we have done work with Georgia Tech to look at offshore wind off the coast of, of Georgia. And the wind, the availability of wind offshore is better than onshore, but it is not good enough to offset the additional cost required to build offshore. Okay. And uh, on the issue of um, Florida being the sunshine state, uh, meaning that uh, a huge percentage of the population from Massachusetts and New York and New Jersey have moved down there based upon that <laughs> advertising. You are saying to us that um, it is really a very cloudy state and it is not good for solar and that perhaps it should be renamed the cloudy state, not the sunshine state. Um, it seems to run contrary to the misimpression that people uh, in the colder, cloudier parts of the country have about your state, sir? Mr. Chairman, I think that there are, uh, Governor Christ reminded us during his, during his Global Climate Forum that uh, Florida is indeed the sunshine state. Um, I think that uh, based on what I know about solar in Florida, there are probably areas in Florida uh, where solar would be a real option. But I think even for Florida, to think that solar is an option for the entire state, because it is a very geographically diverse state, um, uh, I think a lot of work would have to be done uh, to, to make the leap that, that Florida can be the sunshine state in terms of solar generation. Um, my time has inspired. I will now recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Well, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to take up where you left off, and I would like to engage Ms. Floyd, Mr. Foster, in a conversation with Mr. Hobson, because I was struck, uh, Mr. Foster, with your vision of this being a comprehensive approach uh, to be able to deal with technology, to be able to put people to work on site, to be a and with a variety of technologies. And Ms. Floyd, um, you had uh, referenced, for instance, uh, a uh, photovoltaic uh, operation that was located in Germany to take advantage of the opportunities there. And I just, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Hobson, I know you are the expert with your company for environment and alternative energy, and you supplied us with a chart in your testimony about solar intensity as to why solar doesn't work in your service area. I wonder what the, the solar intensity map would look like for Germany, which has four, five times the application. I mean, Ms. Floyd, I'm going to, can you uh, help Mr. Hobson with a different alternative and Mr. Foster and then Mr. Hobson if you just respond? Because it just seems to me we had this conversation and I was stunned with uh, some of the people who have taken the material from your company arguing against a renewable portfolio standard that it would devastate uh, Florida and other states. And it just struck me as a little bizarre. And maybe 
Ms. Floyd, could you help us with an alternative for Mr. Hobson? Um, well, certainly Germany does not have terrific solar insulation or whatever the term is for measuring um, solar intensity, um, and they have built a, you know, a very large industry, I think, uh, uh, growing very rapidly in the last couple of years. If you look at the solar, if you look at the solar resource map, you know, I think the southeast compares very much to Oregon and Washington. And I can tell you that with new technology um, and, and uh, investment capital, entrepreneurs are going out and building large-scale solar in rural areas, so benefiting rural areas, um, with much more efficient solar technology. Obviously, it has to be efficient because you can't get project financing for plants that are not efficient. So building large projects in areas that have the same solar intensity that most of the Southeast has. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Foster? Yes. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, my home state of Minnesota also has a significant forestry and pulp and paper industry similar to the Southeast. Uh, currently, Minnesota is operating at least three biomass electric generation facilities, and interestingly, the creation of one of those facilities resulted in the importation and establishment of a new biomass pelletizing plant that draws as a, a, a source of fiber the poplar in northern Minnesota, a very quick growing tree. Now that those pellets supply the Virginia, Minnesota biomass plant, that facility has expanded and is shipping 60,000 tons of biomass pellets a year through the Great Lakes to Spain, where there is a clear market for biomass feedstock for electric generation. So it seems to me that there is a clear roadmap for an RES producing exactly the kind of market that would make uh, widespread use of the biomass resources of the rest of the country available for electric power generation, and that story is a case in point. Mr. Hobson, does the observations about Germany and Minnesota, which would seem to be at least on a par with the southeastern region, uh, is there anything here or is it just uh, that it is just so far off the charts that that is something that isn't possible for your company? You know, I don't want to give the committee the impression that the Southern Company thinks there are no opportunities for these renewable resources in the Southeast. Certainly there is opportunities. We see a lot of solar applications in the Southeast, primarily on the end use of electricity, which we think is a great application. What we are talking about here is for the generation of electricity. I don't have the luxury of investing in resources that will supply me power for a small percentage of the time and hope that that source of energy will be available when I need it. We have an obligation to serve our customers 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And so we have to know that the energy will be there when we need it. If I need solar and it is not available, my customers are going to suffer. If I need wind and the wind's not blowing, my customers are going to suffer. Renewable resources have some very real opportunities to help us in niche situations and on the margins. But when you're talking about supplying electric power to a broad base of customers who have real demands every day of the year, you have to have energy sources that you can rely on 24 hours a day seven days a week. Thank you, Mr. Hobson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just am struck that uh, there are other parts of the world and other parts of the company, country who face exactly the same challenges in terms of predictability, reliability, that are being able to have the vision to come to scale, have the ingenuity to be able to put these partnerships in place. Uh, I hope that the, your Governor Christ is able to persuade you that Florida and the Southeast is capable of the same ingenuity, the same sort of creativity, the same sort of investment to be able to make it happen there and that is uh, as it is happening in the rest of the country and sadly in the rest of the world uh, ahead of us. Gentlemen's time has expired. There is one roll call on the House floor, a motion to adjourn. The uh, Chair intends on continuing the hearing. So if the members would like to go over to make the roll call. The chair will be here when you come back uh, to be able to recognize you. But I now recognize the gentleman from uh, Kansas, I mean from Missouri, from Kansas City, uh, Mr. Cleaver, uh, for his round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
<clears throat> there is um, the most uh, potential for wind energy uh, in the center of the uh, country. Um, I was on a radio show last week and made the statement that we didn't have the the the, the um, wind potential of some of the surrounding states. And the the uh, interviewer asked me if if the people in Nebraska were stealing our, our wind. Uh, and uh, and 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 the bad part is he was serious. The the. Uh, the, in the great, we have this this issue um, in terms of the potential um, in the Great Plains and in the Northeast. Uh, solar energy has apparently uh, the best uh, potential in the Southwest. Missouri has good wind potential, but in the Northwest area uh, of the state, uh, just to the north of uh, of Kansas City. Um, but not all the state. Uh, uh, the southeastern states and, and members have expressed concern over the possibility of reaching a national RPS because of the lack of potential for such uh, energy. Uh, so only a few states in the southeast have adopted uh, uh, a state RPS. Uh, what is the potential? Uh, what, what are the, the, the problems uh, in, uh, uh, with regard to some areas having wind potential, some not, in us uh, passing a, um, a national RPS, uh, any, anyone. I mean, what are, what, are, what are our challenges? Uh, one of the challenges is infrastructure. I think the, the debate about a renewable energy standard a lot of times focuses on where is the energy going to be produced and, and instead of where is the energy going to be used. And if you look at other resources, be it coal or nuclear or oil or gas, there's a very limited number of states that most of those resources are produced in, and then they are moved to areas where they're used. And actually, uh, there's a great example from Joplin, Missouri, Empire District uh, in your state. It actually is one of the top users of wind energy in the country. It is importing wind from Kansas, but it benefits its ratepayers by being able to lower the electric costs because they're able to reduce natural gas costs. So part of it is just to sort of uh, not necessarily reframe. It's important where it's produced, but it's also important the benefits of, of using it. And that will require infrastructure. And I suspect over time it will be very much like you see with oil and gas and coal and, and uranium. It's going to be produced in the best areas predominantly, and then it will require infrastructure to move to the uh, areas that want to use it. All right, thank you. Chair, rec uh, gentlemen, yield back to balance this time. Great. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for being here today. As I uh, came into the hearing, I heard a number of states in my region mentioned, but not my state of South Dakota. Uh, and I think there are. Uh, there's a consensus brewing that South Dakota has one of the richest wind resources in the country. And I, we do have to get down to the vote, so I just wanted to share a comment um, that I think while state uh, RESs like Minnesota's, Colorado's, I believe Montana recently passed one, are very important as it relates to the community-based energy development that certainly Minnesota has benefited from that I think consumers and citizens of South Dakota could as well, and I'm working with my colleagues in the state legislature back home to talk about the importance of uh, uh, that policy change if it's on the horizon in South Dakota. But in addition to the renewable electricity standard that we hope makes its way into the conference report for the energy bill that we include in the House version, I do think that we have to consider uh, other changes and investments in the, in the electricity grid, access to the WAPA grid when there is room on that grid so that we can, uh, in addition to the resources available in other regions of the state of the country and in the south, we can get those wind resources 
east and west and in every direction. And so I thank you for the work that you're already doing, for the important testimony you've provided here today about what's happening in different states and different regions. Uh, and we hope that uh, within just a, a few years, we can be sharing our rich resource as well as using it locally in the state of South Dakota. So Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I thank the witnesses for their testimony as well on the benefits to rural America of this important resource and being a solution to the nation's energy problems. Thank you. The general lady's time has expired. Uh, they've added two additional roll calls now out on the House floor. So uh, we're going to take a 15-minute recess, and they'll, then we'll reconvene the uh, committee sometime between uh, 5 past and 10 past uh, 11.